Hey, friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's Sean from SGT Report here with what may go down as one of the most important, significant interviews I've ever done. And I got to tell you guys, I'm not going to try to do much talking in this one because my guest is one of the most brilliant people I've ever heard. And I want to pay it forward to my good friend, FM8, that's Eric Firemedic, over on BitChute. Eric just interviewed this man, Nathan Reynolds, and it's one of the most powerful interviews I've ever heard. You know, we can chase the dragon's tail, as my guest just told me before I hit record. Eventually, we'll get to the head, and we'll learn the secrets, and this man knows the secrets. The secrets of the Illuminati, the Bushes, the DuPonts, the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and yes, the Reynolds family. Nathan Reynolds is my guest, and again, my gratitude to my good friend, Eric, Fire Medic 8, for helping us arrange this very important interview. Nathan, welcome. Thanks so much for having me on, Sean. You know, man, I have to tell you, and you know this, I, I, I have to tell you, and you know this because uh, before I hit record, I told you, I feel a little bit like a plagiarist because the interview that Eric did with you is the interview everyone should hear. I'll post it below. You, sir, just said before I hit record, cowardice and compromise is the currency of the kingdom of darkness. So we're going to move forward boldly with courage with love and with integrity in this interview. And I wanna thank you so much for your time. Can you please tell people how they can find your work? Your website, I believe is snatchedfromtheflames.com. Yes, sir. You can find me at snatchedfromtheflames.com. Those of you that wanna reach out to me, you can email me at snatchedfromtheflames at protonmail.com. Uh, I wrote a book, which is goes into a lot more detail of the information that we're gonna be going over tonight. And if you'd like to see that or hear that, I've got audio available, ebook available. If you can't afford it, don't let that information ever be a, don't let lack of funds ever be a reason you can't have access to that information. I give all of that away free in the descriptions of all of my videos. You can buy it for 000 at my website. Please understand that my desire in sharing any of this information is to try to set captives free because I was raised up in a society and in a culture that they compromised and crushed all of my voice, all of my choice, and all of my, my ever hopes for ever being a man of hope, of life. Of any kind of purpose. I just was consumed with despair and with doubt and depravity from the day of my youth. And I found out at the end of all of it, that the truth is there is nothing in this world that can stop you other than your willingness to give up, to surrender, to capitulate, to shove your head back in the comfortable sands of ignorance and to go idly with the agenda instead of using those four most powerful words that you have ever been given. I do not consent and saying, I will not consent to this radical evil. I will not consent to this ancient hate, but instead I will turn and stand directly in opposition to that, which is so strategically working its way to infiltrate every single fact of our life, of our culture, of our identities, of our basic humanity, and instead we can resist. And by doing so, one of us truly can put 1,000 of them to flight, and two of us can put 10,000 to flight, which means if we stand together in true boldness and true confidence, armed with the accurate and precise and carefully studied and well-articulated information that's readily available by turning to things called books, not just relying on everybody else to do the research for us, but we instead learn a discipline to investigate thoroughly all of these matters that are plainly out there for all of us to see and we capitalize on that information while it's still available, and we wage this war with weapons that are not necessarily the weapons that I used to wage my wars with, but if we find out that these weapons are far more effective at doing that, just like you've been doing, Sean, for a lot of years, you've been effective at being able to advance and drive back the forces of despair and the forces of deception for a long time because you've been faithful to pursue that no matter the cost. Well, God bless you. I appreciate those kind words, and I appreciate the encouragement because, you know, where we stand, where one or more of you, where two or more of you gather in my name, I am there. So I do feel like Jesus Christ is with us on this call. And uh, I just want to ask you this. Uh, this interview you did, I was doing a little pre-research here. And well, first of all, who's the interviewer? I'm not familiar. That is, that is Tina Griffin from Counterculture Mom Show. And she was an absolutely fantastic interviewer. And she's she's been driving this home for a long time. She's a more or less a whistleblower from the uh, world of Hollywood who came out against all kinds of the depravity that was being taken place there. And she began to bring forth a lot of information, try to equip parents on making wise decisions with how they raise their families and their children. And so she's been going around to conferences and speaking for a long time and connecting people that are trying to advance this kingdom of truth, as opposed to that, which is the doctrines of deceit. Well, excellent. I know that, uh, well, I know that you were essentially trafficked by your own father. You were sold to your great grandfather by your father. But uh, guys, imagine being born into one of these powerful families, families that practice in the arts of chemicals, science, pharmaceuticals, pharmacia, and they worship a dark order. They, they, they are beholden 
to the kingdom of darkness. They are beholden to the kingdom of darkness. Did she get this right? She writes here that uh, you were born into the Reynolds family empire, but you left it all behind when you learned the cost to receive your inheritance was the life of your firstborn daughter. Is that true? Absolutely. I think there's a, a lack of basic understanding about how trust funds and, and our foundations are distributing out the way for people to receive their inheritances. And for my family, the legalese requirement is that you give over guardianship of your, of your child. For me, I had a firstborn daughter, which meant that they wanted access to her on a regular, ongoing, perpetual basis that increased over time. If I wanted more money, I would have to give them more time with her. And what that meant for, for me and for her was that she was going to be passed through these same fires of transmutation and absolute torture and agony and the splitting of her mind, the splitting of her soul, the destruction of her identity as an individual and instead turned into a collective part of this greater family. For them, it was a, a, an order of this, the, the rosy order and these absolutely abominable knights of Columbus and Jesuits that were operating a human trafficking organization down out of Lake Havasu City, Arizona. And this was a place that was designed from its very architecture and origination point from back in the 1960s by a man who has Robert P. McCulloch, who set it out and laid out that city with a man named C.B. Wood, who was the architect and engineer of Disneyland, who was gathering together some of the best experts in mind control, manipulation, and child exploitation to try to build and design a city who literally trafficked in the souls of men and children in particular. And so they designed it to be a retirement community on an old army airbase that was called Site 6 that was used during World War II to be able to be a relay station as they were transporting troops and munitions across the deserts of of Arizona and California. Lake Havasu City was a was basically a pleasure island that was developed so that people could have anonymity. They brought over, Robert P. McCulloch brought over the London Bridge, the actual London Bridge over the River Thames from the city of London and had it coronated by the Lord's Mayor of London back in 1973 or maybe 71. And at that ceremony in October, they literally created and consecrated that as a sovereign territory here in the United States, the same way an embassy is a sovereign territory of, say, Kenya that's over here in our country. That's a sovereign territory. The city of London legally owns that the island that was created from where the London Bridge crosses over from the Arizona side over Lake Havasu and onto this island. That island is legally the city of London's territory. And what that's generated is a place where they can have diplomatic immunity and they can engage in a lot of this ritualistic abuse of children, pedophilia and trafficking of children and the procurement of human byproducts, cannibalism and I mean, the worst kind of evil that is, for most people, absolutely unimaginable. For them, it is as commonplace as breathing because these people have been raised in a culture of so much compromise that they understand that everybody goes along with this agenda. Everybody goes along with this plan, and we all get paid. And if anybody decides to open their mouth about it, we character assassinate them, we physically assassinate them because – one very critical piece and component that if, if you do not understand this, these people are oath-keeping individuals. They, they swear oaths of allegiance, just like you used to sit up and, and swear this oath. I swear, you know, I, I pledge allegiance to the, the God of America. All of these like oaths and allegiances where you're swearing oaths, it has a legal contract, a binding legal contract on the physical as well as in the spiritual realm. And I know that might be hard for some of you to understand, but there is really a war for the, the, the immortal souls of mankind. People are actively fighting in this war and they're servants to a kingdom that really has priests on this earth. And truly the kings, the merchants, the corporate entities, a lot of the big bad agents of evil that people are identifying, the George Soros, Bill Gates, and these people that are like, look out for the Medicis, look out for the Merovingian, like, look out for these players and of uh, evil. These people serve a different order. This is what gives them the anonymity. This is what gives them the ability to have autonomy on this earth is because they have a spiritual enforcement agency that operates in their better interests, which is the oldest, most ancient intelligence agency that has ever been. People that are only ever committed to do evil continually because from the very beginning, there was a great war that has been waging from the day of our conception, from the day you were born. All of creation on one side is seeking ways to devour you. And on the other side, there is a radical devotion to try to set you free and grant you life and peace and hope. But right there in the middle is this kingdom that we are all born into, this kingdom of this middle earth where we have to wrestle against these beings that we can't physically see or fight against, which is what I was born into. I was born into a kingdom where they literally pass their sons through the fires to Moloch. They make their children go through the fires as burnt 
offerings. They make them be sodomized. They make them be torn apart. They make them be ritualistically sacrificed in order to steal their life force, steal their power, and be able to be controllers of the inheritances that should have been their children's, the, the very vitality and hope that they had. When they swear these oaths, like people that are part of these free Masonic societies, people that are parts of the Jesuits, they literally swear an oath to steal the life away from the third generations, their, their first, second, and third generations. They are literally taking that upon themselves and clothing themselves with it as garment, like a violence, so that they can live off of that. They truly become like a form of vampires, spiritual vampires. And this is why later on in their generations, the children that come from these people are plagued with innumerable ailments and pains and sufferings and problems in their, in their socioeconomic class. They can never get out. This is because a curse is resting upon them because their ancestors literally curse them. And those curses really do have a very powerful binding effect. And this is why the judicial system is not a place where we can go to get the justice that we're all seeking. People are desiring freedom from this. And when I was a young child, I wanted to be able to go to the authorities. I wanted to be able to get set free. But in the very city of where I was, I watched the very same detectives that were supposed to be investigating crimes, the drug yep. crimes, the trafficking crimes. I watched them come into the circle and witness and observe children being molested and then going out and putting on their uniform farm and enforcing the oaths on each other. And this is, this is the component that if you don't really get your head around that this, these oath keepers are the ones who are the greatest traitors who have ever been in our country. The greatest threat to our society are these individuals who are using the freedom of religion, that second amendment. They're operating as if this is Francis Bacon's new Atlantis, this great occult working that they're trying to raise up the old gods. They're trying to re-enchant society and bring about this old order, this old religion that really does openly sacrifice its children. It's the same old gods of Quetzalcoatl. It's the same gods that used to be here before, these plume serpents, which is where America gets its name. The land of the plume serpent, y'all, that's literally what the word America means. It goes back for thousands of years, long before Vespucci was discovering it on a map. This has been the ancient evil that has rested here. This is why there's serpent mounds all over this nation, because there's always been this priest class here who practiced this old way of of abominably destroying the lives of the innocent children in order to fuel a different power source, to fuel a, an elite who are willing to operate within that and being able to be used as agents of evil on this earth. You know, in an interview such as this one, this is like reading a book and then trying to interview the author just using some recall after you've read the entire book just a few days ago. So guys, just forgive me if I don't connect the same dots you all do as you're listening. But one of the things I do want to circle back to here at some point is Nathan mentioning Pleasure Island. Now, let me just show you guys this because he also mentioned the designer of Disney. Well, mm -hmm. remember the Pleasure Island, the is. cursed island that appeared in the animated film Pinocchio, the Disney film and the coachman who literally in the bar negotiates with the other bad guys about essentially snatching little boys and taking them to Ple Pleasure Island. And the good news is those little boys will never be heard from again. Yeah. I mean, good news from the traffickers perspective. So we can talk a little bit about that Epstein Island and uh, the mechanisms of control. But the other thing that you said that really resonates with me is the oaths, the secret oaths, the blood oaths, the path, the pacts that these people take in these circles. Uh, it reminds me of Eyes Wide Shut when Tom Cruise is caught being at this essentially Illuminati sex ritual that he was not supposed to be at. He snuck in uh, and uh, he's called, little does he know what he's in for. Check this out, guys. And then I want Nathan's response. I want, uh, and then I want Nathan's comment about this. By the way, this was directed by, by the way, for those that don't Stanley know, this Kubrick. is the Stanley Kubrick film, Eyes Wide Shut. And we're told there were about 24 minutes that were cut out of this film, yeah. even though Stanley had final cut, because I think it was Warner Brothers, whoever controlled this movie, didn't want it out. So anyway, this is not the final cut. That's my understanding. But this is a very, very powerful scene, and it speaks directly to what Nathan was just describing. I'm going to just stop real briefly. I, this is, to me, one of the most, how would I even say it? One of the scariest scenes I've ever seen in a motion picture. I, I just, it really resonates with me because I know this stuff actually happens. Please, come forward.
Nathan, I'll sum this down. We can just talk here. I'm going to let it play. The part I want to get to is where he doesn't know the password. And it doesn't matter if he's known it or if he's, it doesn't matter if he's forgotten it or if he's never known it at all because words and promises have meaning here. Yeah. Well, one of the things I want to do is just read to you guys the Jesuit oath, which will help you to actually understand what is actually taking place when, when people enter into these ceremonies, when they enter into a ritual that is being done. I think there's an illusion that people have about a ritual always looking like the format you're seeing here, which is very pretty. I'll be honest. This is not what the vast majority of any of these things look like. This is a very rare exception to it where everyone's dressed up, everyone looks nice, everyone's pretty, and there's no babies and children walking around everywhere because that's the other side of this that is obviously so uncanny and disturbing for most people that they could not put that in there. But that's the reality that's the missing component that you're seeing here is that these people are not the wealthy, elite-looking people. They are your normal dads and moms and people that you see at the grocery store every single day and they are all around you walking around carrying these secrets of, of un unutterable agony and sorrow and depravity and in the coffers of their mind are inexcusable radical intelligent evil this happens because people are willing to swear oaths like this because they want access to power wealth resources and they are willing to do whatever it takes to climb to the top because this is what happens when you become completely given over to what's called the greediness for gain and this is the oath they swear in ceremonies like this where they say i furthermore promise and declare that i will when opportunity presents itself make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics protestants liberals as i am directed to do extirpate exterminate them from the face of the whole earth and that it will spare neither age nor sex or condition, and that it will hang, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive, all alive, these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poison cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the palmyard, and the leaden bullet, regardless of the honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed to do so by any agent of the Pope or superior of the brotherhood of the holy faith of the society of Jesus. This is what the archons of our society are willing to do in order to advance this great intelligent kingdom of darkness. This is the black pope who oversees the Jesuit order. This is the one who is willing to use absolute compromise in a total war. This is the, the, the philosophical justification for using any means necessary in order to win. This is why the Jesuits were birthed. They were birthed out of, out of the desire to utterly blot out and stop the Reformation, which was leeching and stealing power away from those who have held it so inexplicably for so many generations. They were willing to do whatever it took to destroy that. And the way they did that was to adopt the tactics of the Hashashins, the assassins, to embolden themselves like we see with Adam Weishaupt and the Bavarian Illuminati, to create rings within rings within, within rings of individuals who are in the know and individuals who would like to think they're in the know, and then those who are on the outside trying to understand what is going on and being willing to serve the agenda of the system as a whole. And this is what takes place when people like the Knights of Columbus, my grandfather is a, is a fourth order Knights of Columbus down in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, still to this day. And he oversaw this agenda that would specifically shatter the minds of children through systemic continual abuse. And while doing that, they would then try to identify what are ways that we can use this, exploit this child so that we can advance our agenda. I had this desire for vengeance. I had innate in me a desire to fight back. I wanted to resist. I wanted to stop it. I wanted to stop the evil. I wanted to never have to witness another child go through what I was going through and what my, my friends and my family members were going through. I wanted to resist them and blot them out of the face of the earth. And so it only took a little bit of twisting and a little bit of training to let me loose and go after people that were oath breakers and start to hunt them down and systemically kill them, poison them, strangle them, eradicate them from this earth to dispose of their body in their body moratoriums that were there in Lake Havasu to throw them in the lake and to fill that place with the blood of the innocents and watch as I thought I was finally getting my vengeance because all I ever wanted to do was destroy this kingdom of darkness. As long as I've been around, I just wanted to see it burn. I wanted to see the secrecy be snuffed out. I wanted to see truth shine 
being like a beacon to all the nations so that somebody who was trapped in those cages of darkness would know there are still brave warriors out here who will fight for them, who will stand in opposition no matter what the cost is, and they would resist unto their death because they would not be filled with those same fears. And so I got emboldened to try to fight back, but I still had this collar around my neck and I was being used and manipulated and beguiled all the way through my childhood for so long. And I knew I needed a way out. And I believed and was groomed to see the United States military as the true heroes, as the guys who were fighting the good fight, as if I could finally have a unit of guys that would go with me into the darkness and infiltrate places just like that. The first time I ever got an opportunity to do that was after I got emancipated to the United States military at 17 years old as a junior in high school and shipped off to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And I started getting training in the United States military on how to work as a unit, how to work as a team. And then by the time I turned 18 years old, I shipped off to Fort Lee, Virginia, and I had a few weeks to myself in order to enact and with these, these underground protocols, with these unacknowledged special access projects. And Mark, the major oversight team of that is what people would call strategic assassinations. They would use this word called strategic strikes. That's the more um, publicized way of saying it when the director of the CIA sits on in front of everyone and says, we use metadata to, to kill people. He's not joking. They say surgical strikes. What they are talking about is tiny little people is people walking around with tiny little knives and shoving them through people's brain stems and then dumping their bodies inside of a car accident so people think they die from smashing their neck against the steering wheel so that the autopsy doesn't really show the accurate results. This is the way I started working in the, in the military to try to fight back and contend against the system. The problem was is as I finally got to work with these teams of who I thought were the world's tier one operators, the guys who were the best equipped, the best trained to be able to go after and hunt these monsters in the night, I got sent into an estate in Virginia that was just like that one where people did dress up and people were pretty and people wore their uniforms with their names on them and were willing to show off their power and their prestige by engaging in ritualistic abuse of children. But I was only allowed to capture one guy out of the entire room instead of detonating and destroying a device inside there that could have killed everyone, could have captured everyone on video doing that. I was only allowed to capture one guy. His name was Mr. Blue. And he would like to skin children alive with a bone, with a skin grafting tool, and then wear their suits of skin on his flesh and then abuse them. And this was a guy I was tasked to go after. And I was able to capture him and extract him out of that building and bring him back to a safe house where we could do interrogations on him. And he was able to cough over the information. But what I learned at the end of that was they put their own asset in his place. And that guy was just as disgusting, just as pedophilic, and just as willing to embrace the darkness. And I saw that at the end of it, people are willing to do and continue to perpetuate evil as long as the financial costs, as long as the state secrets are guarded, whatever motivating factor it may have been, that I saw corruption continually rippling through every one of these arenas wherever I went. People were willing to compromise. People were willing to, to, to cling to the power at any cost. And I could not handle it. I was utterly detested and disgusted by it. And I was dedicating myself to try to fight back against the very system that now I was a part of because I had become a cog in their wheel and I wanted a way out. And you know what? I finally got that way out, but it was through an utter destruction of my identity. It was through an absolute loss of everything I'd worked for, everything I'd waited for to finally go and hunt monsters with my men. I instead was stripped of that honorably discharged from the military and washed out into the world of the living, the normal people, the people that don't know about this side of society, that are willfully ignorant, going about in a, in a fluoride stare, in a pharmaceutical haze, unable to really see the forest from the trees or see the men that are trafficking children in their city every single night. And I was trapped in this constant monotony of misery, trying to find a way to make $12 an hour instead of getting paid 10 ounces of gold a day for my previous work. It was unutterably frustrating, and I was, I was wrestling with how do I fight back because every time I go and kill one of their guys, kill one of my marks, I would find out that sooner or later somebody else was going to rise up and take their place, and I was fighting against this inevitable hydra, and if I kept trying to stomp it out and crush its head, more were popping up every single time, and I realized this really was an information war, and I started hearing and seeing these brave and courageous men who were willing to say no to the agenda, say no to compromise, and instead whistleblow against wickedness instead of standing and in in the corner and looking away from the scary stuff they were willing to turn boldly towards it and rebuke it like a man named russ Dizdar. this man wrote this book yep that so helped to set me free it's called a black awakening the rise of the satanic super soldier and the coming chaos and in this book you guys the most valuable part of the entire book 
is the references. I can't encourage you enough. If you would just be willing to learn one thing of anything I have to say tonight, learn to read diligently, not just to read, on, not just to read so you can follow instructions and stay in your slavery, but to critically analyze the information that's coming in and across your mind, and then learn how to communicate that to other people. This ability to speak and communicate is innate in all of us. It had to get systemically bred out of us through the deliberate dumbing down of our society, through the education system, through the compulsory education system. John Taylor Gatto does an incredible job at dismantling that. If any of you want to understand that you can watch a five-hour series by richard grove who interviewed john taylor gatto and it's called the underground history of american education and it will help you to unlock why the carnegie foundation and the rockefeller institute and why the Rhodes scholarship why did these people begin financing the education system and driving society in a direction that took us away from autonomy that took us away from self self-reliance that took us away from biblical values that split open our home and raped us of our wives and our children and left us in this entire kingdom of radical intelligent evil Boy, guys, I'm kind of speechless and I've been taking notes here. So what I'm going to try to do is just keep up with Nathan and I'll ask questions that are pertinent to something he's just said. But I do want to circle back at some point and ask him about the Hampstead cover up. I want to ask him about Laura Logan and child sexual abuse. Uh, uh, your child, I want to ask him about his childhood, his trauma, his conditioning, how he broke all of that and escaped with his soul intact. But one of the follow up questions based on what you just said that I want to ask is regarding Mr. Blue. He liked to skin children alive and wear their skin. We've heard about Frazzle Drip, the video that reportedly or purportedly shows something similar involving Hillary Clinton and possibly Uma Abedin. We don't have to talk about Frazzle Drip. I don't know if that's real or not real. But what I do know is that there was lots of spooky, terrible stuff on Anthony Weiner's laptop. It's all been covered up. But the point I want to make is that this stuff does happen. There are Mr. Blues in the world. And I don't know if Hillary Clinton's one of them, but there are people that do this to children, and we need to make that very clear. This isn't the realm of Pizzagate conspiracy or Pedogate conspiracy theory. We're not talking about Comet Ping Pong. We're talking about stuff that really, really happens in the darkest regions, the netherworld, the darkest netherworld regions of this world. It, it, it really happens, doesn't it? Absolutely. And the, the, it's, it's easy to hide because people don't want to see it, and that's all the illusionists need. They just need an audience that's willing to be duped. They just willing. This is all a great hypnotist is ever going to need. G.H. Chester books wrote a book on hypnotism back in the 40s, which was the user guide for standardization of how to systemically use hypnosis, mind control, the shattering of the psyche, and find susceptible individuals who would be willing to go along to create these Manchurian candidates. The greatest state secret in our in the United States in the governing structure of our country is the systemic abuse and the shattering of the minds of children. This is something that has been going on for a long time. And that ancient evil, the old religions, like I was raised by a family that practiced this old religion of serpent eating and of drinking of the blood of these serpents and consuming of human flesh for generations because they found that through foretelling, like the serpent when he's there with Yeshua contending with him, and he says, I'm going to take you up to a high place and show you all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. He foretelled, he showed him the future. And yet Yeshua rebuked him. He rebuked him because he asked him to just bow down and worship him. He could have the keys to the kingdom. He'd give him everything he ever wanted. And he's a liar. He's a father of lies. And all he ever can do is give you false promises, which is what this political tongue of, of uh, political messiahs that are out there and people are thinking and putting their hope in. They are still servants of this fork tongue. They're soothsayers because they've swallowed the lies of the serpent and they've been willing to take to bow the knee to Satan. And I know that seems so incredibly impossible that these individuals that you're looking at on your TV as being heralded as the wonderful people, the right influencers, the safe and effective doctors that you can trust, the white world priests that we should bow down to and give our allegiance to and give our dollars to. Those individuals, y'all, even just in the, in the realm of the medical industry, they swear an oath to Hermes. They swear an oath to Apollo. That Hippocratic oath that you think is for you and your better interest is literally to another mighty one. And they are binding themselves and attaching themselves spiritually to that kingdom. So you wonder why they're not able to really break out very often, why they can't separate themselves from that. It's because they're under a spiritual influence. And when people engage in this type of depravity, when they're willing, when a society is willing to sacrifice its own children, to keep the government propped up, you are absolutely in a place where you have a complete and total slave state. 
and you have one that is only in control continually. And we think because we live in this modern society that those old things we read about in the, in the Bible don't still take place every single day. They are still sacrificing their children and burying them in the walls. The reason that Robert McCulloch, under the direction of C.V. Wood, the engineer and architect of, of Disneyland, the reason they brought that London Bridge over stone by stone was because they've been singing this nursery rhyme forever that the London bridge is falling down, falling down. They've been encoding in a society and generations that sing sign nursery rhyme song is about why you need to sacrifice your children and to entomb them in the stone walls of that bridge in order to keep it up. And as soon as they have that, it's the same and same absolute thing that was happening all the way back with Pharaoh and how Egypt and Mitzrayim, how they controlled the people. They got the Israelites to be willing to even entomb their own children in the walls of their buildings. And once that takes place, the blood, the iniquity begins to cry out, just like in Sodom and Gomorrah. It said the cry was reaching up to heaven. It's not just that people were wanting to have sex with people of the same sex. It's that they were going after strange flesh, like it says in the book of Jude and Second Peter. They were trying to seek a genetic alteration. They were trying to seek the re enhancement programs of what you saw before the flood, this, these archons, these watchers, Azazel and Gadriel and Simyaza, these ones who came down with the secrets of heaven, the Bnei Ha Elohim, these mighty ones who were willing to shapeshift themselves, the Decepticons, the Transformers coming down out of the heavens and manifesting themselves as the son of light, as, as these creatures of light who were here to imbue wisdom and knowledge and explain to them the secrets of heaven. And by, by taking wives of mankind, they created this hybridized beast, these Nephilim, these fallen ones who were half human and half immortal. And they found no place after their flood, after they were destroyed and blotted out, their spirits remained, these lust spirits that are eating that are always hungry and never satisfied they're always thirsty and they can never be quenched and they go out and enact their will of their prince who is over them master mahasatan that we that they could instead create a different power source for their kingdom and that is iniquity that is the continual ongoing rebellion the willingness to do embrace evil and swallow it in that when that takes place there's a genuine change a transformation that happens physiologically in you and in your seed in your in your genetics so that you are no longer made in the image of man but instead you become changed and transformed to be like a beast man and and beast were created on the same day but what differentiated us from them is that we had the breath the the life of of yahuwah he breathed into us and we became living souls he created us and sculpted us as a image bearer of him but when we turn the whole agenda of that dragon is to eat dust all the days of his life. He was cursed. He lost his wings. He lost his fiery radiance, and he crawls on his belly day and night eating the dust. And you know what? Men are the dust of the earth. That is where we came from. That is what we were made. We are mankind. And he goes out to seek to kill, steal, and destroy everyone's life. And this has been the system that he has chosen to bring about that will. This is the agents of evil who are operating day and night. This is why they're able to live for so long. Just like the, the industry of you, you guys – are, are literally in a, in a society where blood is the currency of it. And I know this is a big, bizarre kind of statement to make, but when you go outside and you drive past a plasma donation center, a blood bank, or you see the, the, the Red Cross ask, asking people to donate blood and we'll give you a cookie or we're going to give you $30, that, that kingdom is there to take the blood that is donated. Only 20% of it actually gets used in the version that you're thinking of where it's taken to a hospital and people that are in need are going to get access to it. 80% of that blood is turned into pharmaceutical products that are then sold and fed back to the mouses so that people are engaging in cannibalism, the consumption of life. It says in the scriptures over and over again, the life is the blood. The blood is in the life. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Don't eat it. Anytime you read in any type of book before they had exclamation points and question marks and all of these other ways of that we used to communicate, they would just repeat themselves. That was the way they could scream it to you and say, never forget this. This is why Yeshua is saying, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you. When he's saying that, he's trying to tell you this is critical and important information. And so when he's repeating himself over and over again, don't eat the blood from beginning to end, he says, don't eat the blood because that's the life. That does not belong to you. It belongs to the earth because the earth is one that gave its life for everything to live. And you know what? That's where the blood is supposed to go back to. But instead, when people are consuming that and they're using it as a pharmaceutical product, and they're using that as a way to extend their life, that's vampirism, y'all. And we are totally caught up in a society of these Grigori, these same watchers that came down 
at Sodom and Gomorrah and began their genetic alteration campaign again to fill the land of Canaan with these hybrids, with these giants, with these strongholds of iniquity, with these abominations. It said that when Abraham was out there wandering around, the father told him that you can't go into that land because the iniquity of the Amorites is not full. That iniquity force is the fuel for the kingdom of darkness. A man who does a very a, a, a well-articulated expression of this is Dr. Michael Lake. He wrote a book that is called The Shinar Directive, and this is preparing the way for the son of perdition. This book goes through a lot more detail. He's a scholar. So those of you that are really interested in learning from people that have a more scholarly, scholastic, engineering kind of style of delivery, he's the guy to go to for that. And you can read this book. It's not a hard read. It's a fantastically well-articulated way of dismantling this kingdom of darkness and how this system brought itself about and how what are our weapons to fight against this? Because I know I'm talking about a lot of really heavy and dark and intense things, but the truth is there's good news at the end of this because if these people are so committed to this kingdom of darkness, it's because there is a true adversary to them. There truly is a kingdom of righteousness. There truly is a kingdom of light that instead stands in absolute opposition of it. And as much as the darkness may seem so horrific, so abominable, and you want to turn your face from it. The only way it will ever thrive is if we continue to hide our eyes from it. But you know what? The reason I'm out, Eric, the reason I have any hope, any joy, any life that has ever been coursing through my veins is because I could never have the hope that was in my heart extinguished. No amount of torture, no amount of abuse, no amount of continual, ongoing, perpetual failures and loss and depravity that happened to me and to the people I loved around me could extinguish this single light that was burning in me. And that light was a hope that there was going to come a day where people looked around and they said, enough, enough. This is our time to stand and resist this. This is our time to speak the secrets. This is our time to rise up with the three most powerful weapons that have ever been given to us to fight and wage a war against this dragon. Hidden in the, this book are all kinds of verses and keynotes because there's a code hidden in here that as you start to read, I talk about. And if you follow these breadcrumbs, it will lead you to understand how you dismantle this empire. And right there hidden in his coat is Revelation 12. Revelation 12, 11 says the enemy, that dragon, that serpent of old is defeated by the blood of the lamb, the words of our testimony and not loving our lives when faced with death. Those are the weapons in our warfare. These used to be the weapons in my warfare. I learned how to use these because this is exceedingly more effective at killing somebody than ever your pistol is going to be. There's a reason more than 80% of people who get shot with handguns walk away from it basically fine, y'all. There's a reason soldiers don't fight with handguns unless they absolutely have to. Don't be so committed to the weapons of your warfare that are carnal. If you could st instead read a book for every firearm you have or read a book and for every vert bullet that you have, it would transform you and equip you with a skill set, with a mindset, with an understanding to navigate these muddy waters and begin to set out life rafts to bring deliverance and healing and hope and courage and conviction back to those people who are trapped on those pleasure islands, who are trapped on the islands where they're just clicking orders home, ship here, eating their Amazon and their Netflix, and they're just going to sleep and being lulled away into this listless loser lifestyle that is destroying their purpose because we were made to fight. We were made to be soldiers. We were made to resist and overcome and contend and to not be filled with all of the fear. The reason Edward Bernays was so effective, he wrote his manual, by the way, if you read this tiny little book, it's, it is less than 150 pages, 168 pages. You can read this book in a couple of hours, and you will be equipped with an understanding of the mechanics of how this system has destroyed every aspect of our culture, our identity, the freedoms that we once inherited as, as truth. It will help you to understand the why for so many of those questions that you're wrestling with as to why the world looks the way it is today. These people engineered the society in the image of the beast because they used fear to drive us. They used hatred and violence and war and bloodshed and, and dread. Like today, we fight invisible enemies. They're like, I grew up in the era of, of the war on terror, the war on terror. How are you going to kill terrorism? How are you going to kill terror? It's, it's an absolute invisible war that allows you to get a, an invisible check for however much you want. Just don't tell us what's going on out there. We don't want to know about it. We don't want to know about all of the mind control experiments that are going on like another book that you all should read called Men Who Stare at Goats. Don't watch the movies for all of these films. 
for all of these books. Read the book. The book goes into great detail about how these things have been operating and happening for generations and how the United States military secret projects really are psi warriors. They really are teams of children assassins. This is what the origins come from, what is called the Jason group. These are the Jason projects, these, these secret spies that are raised up and cultivated through Project Talent and Project Gate, these, these these gifted and talented programs in the schools where they, they're looking for certain children with aptitudes that they can bring in and put them into these, these systems so that they can be handled by these corporate entities so that they can be their chosen ones to operate and carry out their agendas, which is why this unrelenting locomotive of wickedness, of, of evil is continuing to chuggle on every single day and night. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions at once, and you can just answer whatever you'd like. So uh, George Clooney comes to mind, by the way, when you mention men who stare at goats. And uh, he has to know a great deal of what you're talking about. And I think a lot of these people, Hillary Clinton certainly does. Uh, and and uh, she joked in those WikiLeaks emails about sacrificing a uh, chicken to Moloch in the backyard. Uh, Jason Bourne comes to mind, too, those Bourne Identity movies. I'm just sort of brainstorming here as I'm taking notes on everything you've just said. So here are my two questions. Were you in the special forces? Because it sounds like whatever raid you guys did on that mansion in Virginia, by the way, that sparked my thoughts of the Biltmore mansion in Asheville. I don't know if you've ever seen the pool I in the have. basement of that there. place. It's spooky as hell. But uh, why were you guys handicapped? Why were you pigeonholed? Why did the operation only yield one evil person, Mr. Blue? That's question number one. Question number two. Abortion as a ritual, transhumanism, transsexuals, human hybrids, bioweapons masquerading as vaccines. You mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah at least twice. How close are we to as bad as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah today? How bad? How close are we to those? What would you even call them? Abominations to those abominations. The land is filled with the blood. What do you think happens after somebody goes in and commits infanticide in the temples of Planned Parenthood? What do you think they do with those aborted fetal, what, what they do with the, the babies, the infants, the person that was inside them? What do they do with that? They sell that off, they, compart they, they chop that thing off, and they sell it to who? Pharmaceutical companies, predominantly, researchers, right? What did they do with the blood? They wash it down a drain, and it drains down into their sewer system. And where does that go? Into our rivers, into our creeks, and it's passed on to our neighbors time and time again. This land has been filled with violence. This land is filled with the blood of the innocents. And that blood, don't ever forget that that blood cries out day and night as a perpetual witness, demanding justice, mishfat. It says the foundation of Yahuwah's throne, I used to know him as the Lord God Almighty. I began to study and learn his name so that I could have differentiation between what God I was talking about because I found a lot of people use this word God interchangeably for their God and my God. And I wanted to make sure to learn that there was a way of communicating clearly that I'm not talking about their Gayatu, their God of the universe. I'm talking about the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who formed you for a purpose and for a destiny and for a calling. That blood cries out day and night demanding justice the foundations of his throne it says are mishfat and zadika those are hebrew ways of saying justice and righteousness those are literally the pillars that he sits upon and so when that blood sits there it cries out and that blood begins to fill up a cup it begins to fill up a cup that will fill his hand with wrath and people have no idea of how dreadful and awful and terrifying what the dread that these people, like I was describing earlier, the dread that they have when they lay down at night, that dread is because that iniquity is upon them. And as much as they get power from enacting these, the, in these, these things, as much as they get power, like you talked about with Hillary Clinton, people that are willing to do and engage in these acts, Hillary Clinton said by her own lips in a speech that she was channeling the spirit of Eleanor Roosevelt. This is the former first lady talking to the former first lady spirit. This is necromancy, by the way. That's what you would call that. She's, an, she's a publicly confessed necromancer who is standing there saying she's channeling her spirit. Eleanor Roosevelt, by the way, engaged in a lot of what is called the spiritism movement. This is people who were engaging with, with witchcraft and sorcery and divination in order to channel and talk to other spirits. What we would call today, if you ever read the scriptures, the witch of Endor, right? People that summoned people's dead relatives and talked to them and conjured with them and communicated with them. Things were warned very explicitly. Don't go into that stuff. Don't go after that stuff because it's going to lead you down a path of death. It's not a, it's not a maybe. It's an absolute guarantee because when you consume and drink from the cup of demons like these people are doing, they are going to reap their punishment. They're going to reap the consequences for doing so, which is truly destruction. Ultimately, there is going to be a judgment 
for every man, woman, and child on this earth. We are going to be held accountable for all of our decisions, every thought that we ever had. And by our words, we're going to be justified. By our words, we're going to be condemned. When you stand there and all your life is laid bare, and they open and examine the books which have been written from the day you were born on everything you've done. It's a very real reality. You think that you know something about people because you have data storage or the NSA is able to spy in and listen in on us. They have nothing in comparison to absolute truth, which has always been written, that will never be able to be forged, obfuscated, deleted, lost like the evidence on his laptop. No, there is an absolute account of records and the judge of all the earth who they say he doesn't see when they go down in those, place, those dark places. He sees them all. He who formed the eyes, does he not see? He who formed the ears, does he not hear? He heard those screams of those children when I was down there in that house, when I was down there in that estate and looking at the ritual wound, which was carved from black stone and had drainage canals for where the blood could run into the center of the room and an altar at the epicenter of it, like an amphitheater. For these people to sit and, con and conjure and cut and coerce people into the worst kind of evil. And then they have hall rooms for guests, just like a hotel would, where people could go with the prostitutes, male children, little boys, and go back and destroy them and ravage them. And cleanup teams would come in after them and dispose of all of the evidence and turn it into meat products to be rendered down and sold to the next guy. This is the archons. This is their agency of evil. And the reason the United States military didn't snuff that out is because you're dang right we're pigeonholed day and night because the people above us have sworn these same oaths and the people that are next to us are enforcing the same thing. Like people, I just had a conversation with the United States Marshal. That's just a little side note, random thing that just showed up one day up in front of my house. A random a U.S. Marshal started talking to me about some of the things that he had been a part of and was doing. And I started sharing with him my testimony and this background in my life. And I asked him, if there's anything you could ever do with the United States Marshals, what would you want to do? If you had one dream job, he was a believer, by the way, he was a man of righteousness, a state trooper for a long time. And he had a zealousness for sharing and evangelizing and being somebody to try to help people who were in an absolutely horrible, depraved situation. Like after they got arrested for a DUI or DWI or the negligent homicide or murder, like he had opportunities to witness to people at the, the most critical moment of their life. And then he is now in the United States Marshals and he's in a completely different position where he's not getting to do those same things and he's feeling trapped and stuck. And I asked him, what would you do if you had one, if you could do one thing and one thing only, what would you do? And he thought, I would try to rescue children. I would try to be a part of human trafficking operation, counter human trafficking operations. And then I began to explain to him what, what that takes and what's required of you. And this is the side that you don't get on the movies. This is the side they won't put on the, on the uh, propaganda poster where they're trying to recruit you into the United States Marine Corps. They're trying to recruit you into the criminal justice system. And they're like, come be a part of the elite warriors who are going to save the world. What they don't tell you is that in order for you to infiltrate these pedophile rings, they're going to teach you how to be a pedophile. They're going to make you be a pedophile in your mind. I'm, this is not some kind of theoretical thing. They're going to sit you down and train you on how pedophiles think, on how child exploitation rings operate. They're going to teach you how to become one. Then they're going to teach you to be one. And this is where things become dark. This is where they become evil. Because in order for you to be participant within that system, they're going to compromise you, and they're going to make you watch child pornography. They're going to make you watch explicit snuff films of children being murdered, tortured, agonized in explicit content for endless hours until you crack. And the old man of who you used to be, the one that never saw that side of the world before that moment, the one who is doing this because he wants his children to grow up in a safe society, that man's conscience is going to get seared with a hot iron because he is going to come face to face with an evil that stops the hearts of people because they're so filled with dread and terror and absolute revolt that they're going to, you know what they're going to do in that moment? If you maintain your conscience, if you maintain your Holy Spirit, your resistance, and you don't want that, and you don't want to look at that, they're going to execrate you out of that thing like a piece of trash. They're going to get rid of you because what they're actually looking for in order to be a part of that is people who are willing to go the distance and become the evil, embrace it, swallow it like a pill you take in the morning for your supplement. They will swallow that darkness, and they will embrace it, and they will become the pedophiles. They will become the traffickers. They will become these things as a cover in order to slip their way in, and then all it takes is somebody else like what I was doing, who's an outsider investigating, who films them and documents them in that room with those other people. And I now have evidence that they're engaging in pedophilia, that they're engaging in, the, in cannibalism and necrophilia. And when I have that kind of evidence, that's all I need in order to do what I used to do best, which was to eradicate these people from the face of the earth, to make them disappear. And instead, I'm being told to stand down because we got our guys in there. 
And you're like, oh, yay, hurrah. They're clearly doing a great job allowing this to go on day and night. And it just it's that psyche of learned helplessness that continued to come along in my life, that there was compromise that was so infested in every area I had ever seen. And when I explained that scenario to the United States Marshal, you know what happened to him? He got a dose of understanding that was so inutterably painful because that's the death of an idol in our culture. We think these guys are going to save the day, but the brutal, absolute, and disgusting reality is these men have been compromised because they stood in a room and swore an oath of allegiance to something other than the truth. It should, Yeshua said, don't swear an oath, neither by heaven nor earth, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. You should have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove and expose them. That's your duty. So if you're caught up in the kingdom of corruption, you should do your absolute due diligence to gather every bit of evidence that you can and expose what is being done in secret to the light because it's the only way justice will happen. There is no way you're ever going to stop mold from infesting and taking over unless you bring it to the light. But as long as you all are willing to compromise and keep the secrets for your other brothers, for your other sisters, this is going to fester, it's going to multiply, and it's going to infect the society and continue to justify judgment, destruction, unutterable curses that are being poured out on our nation because men, have, righteous men have stood by and done nothing. And as long as they're willing to do that, judgment is going to fall upon this nation. But if we are willing to say no more, if we are willing to turn and face the darkness and resist and contend and fight back with the weapons of our warfare, which are not carnal, but are mighty in Yahuwah to the pulling down of these strongholds. And these are the strongholds of all strongholds. We are supposed to advance the kingdom of righteousness, advance the kingdom of truth and destroy their gates. The way we do that is by raising up a generation who is set apart, who is not like them. The reason I am here, the reason I have any desire to do any of this is because I was not willing for Naomi, my daughter, to suffer what I suffered. I was not willing for her to bear the brunt of brutes on her backs. I wanted her to know peace. I wanted her to lay down knowing that she had a shepherd who was watching over her, vigilantly guarding her, who was willing to lay down his life for her to give her the one thing they never gave me, which was a choice. If they had given me a choice, I would have never consented. And you all still have a choice. As long as there's breath in your body, you have a choice. No matter how much they're going to manipulate you, no matter how much they're going to weaponize propaganda, press releases, the white robe priests, the governors, the doctors, the politicians, no matter how much they weaponize wickedness, you have the ability to say, I abstain. No. No, thank you. No, you cannot have my family. No, you cannot touch my children. No, you cannot destroy their identities because their identities are not something ethereal. Their identities were given to them the day they were conceived. They are persons, they are mankind, and they were made for purpose. And nobody else is allowed to give them that, but they were made to be free. You were made to be free. And at, you, at some point in your life, if you will trace back to that moment where you capitulated, where you looked away from it, when you saw the evidence of some kind of horrible sexual abuse happening in your family, in your friends, in your coworkers, and you said nothing, you can turn away from that. That's what repentance is. It's an old way of saying turning and having nothing to do with that and going in the opposite direction and clinging instead to the way of righteousness, the way of truth, the way of peace, the way of set apartness. My daughter, Naomi, and now my four children are being raised up outside of that system. And you know what? That drove us to poverty. That drove us to being migrant workers volunteering by the sweat of my face to labor on natural and organic farms to try to find a way to feed my family, sustain my family, to learn a skill set that I had been totally deprived of that I never learned once in school, which is how to be a father, how to be a husband, how to be a dad, and how to raise up my family and teach them the necessary skills for what food is and what food is not, how to raise animals, how to raise livestock. And it's led me on a life of regenerative agriculture and meeting some of the best people in the world and becoming a farm manager and learning how to homestead and learning how to wage a war of rebellion because we don't need a revolution where we go back to the same place we started. We need a revival where people are willing to light up the signal towers and say, this is a house of refuge. This is a city of refuge. And as here we stand, we can do no other. We will not consent to the cowards. We will not give in. We will resist with our very lives and with the blood of the lamb as our weapon. We will absolutely be cleansed and we will cleanse this land and ask the father to forgive the sins committed here so that we can have homes of hope again. Well, you're really a gift to all of us. And, uh, you know, I just want to say as it pertains to courage, before I hit record, guys, Nathan and I were talking and he said these words. 
for those of you who stand down when you see evil, for those of you who don't want to get engaged, for those of you who want to stay off the radar, for those of you who just say, just leave me the hell alone with my TV dinner and my nightly news, and I'll be okay. Cowardice and compromise is the currency of the kingdom of darkness. So when you practice coward, cowardice and compromise and you don't get involved, you are trading in the currency of the kingdom of darkness. So here's my question I wanted to ask you. You come from a very powerful family, and yet somehow you escaped with your soul. You got out of this. Because I can tell you, you know, I interviewed Ella Draper, the mother of the Hampstead cover-up kids, mm. Gabriel and Elisa. Mm. Those children couldn't escape. Why? Well, because they described horrible satanic ritual abuse at the hands of teachers, at the hands of doctors, at the hands of policemen that were at these satanic rituals, they say. And there is evidence that they were both violated anally. These are little kids who can point to, who can draw pictures of specific teachers who they say had satanic tattoos on their private parts. Okay, that should be very easy for the police to suss out. But what happened is the whore mainstream media in the UK turned against the mother, Ella Draper. They propped up the father, by the way, Ella Draper was not married to Ricky Dearman, but she had two kids with him. Ricky Dearman was brought on, did a 60 minute or CB, uh, 60 minute type, uh, 60 minutes type puff piece about the guy, didn't address any of the allegations. And ultimately, Ella Draper had to flee the country because they were going to put her in prison because they said she was a liar. And yeah. the children were returned to Ricky Dearman, who then showed up a couple of years later in an eBay commercial in the United States under another name. And he was being given a small business award with the two kids behind him, now older, but they're the same kids, Gabriel and Elisa. Those children couldn't escape. How in the world with such a powerful family did you escape? Devastating to hear that. I haven't, oh, heard, the I asked... I haven't heard the continuity of the Hampstead case in a while. There was a the guy who was very critically important in helping me to get set free was a man named Tom Dunn. Tom Dunn uh, worked with uh russ Dizdar for many years and he had a channel that was called through the black he still has it on uh through the black.com and through the black two on youtube and he was covering the hampstead case and that's one of those things that shut him down they shut him down and deplatformed him and all the rest of that but that the methods you just described eric i'll, I'll circle back to the the question on getting out the methods you described for how this is able to be continued on and how, how those children are coerced back into that kingdom and forced back into it is, is the same tactics that corporations use to destroy whistleblowers. Instead of dealing, it's the most prevalent logical fallacy that ever occurs. And for those of you that don't know about logical fallacies, it would behoove you. That means it would help you if you would study how people use rhetoric wordsmiths use it to control and manipulate people the word that we have in antiquity is called sophists these were people that were engineering and playing with words and fallacies to manipulate people these were the edward bernays in the past these were what we would talk about with politicians doublespeak these are people that we would use the word sophisticated to describe them. They are people that are engineering words in order to bounce around the issues. Like when you watch people at the House Senate committees dancing around the topic saying, I don't recall, you know, and all of these just ways of getting out of it. Those people who are trying to keep this, this kingdom of corruption going, they attack the witness. It's called an ad hominem attack. Instead of dealing with the evidence that have been put forth, instead of dealing with the arguments that are being brought forward, the person who's in a weaker position because they're standing on sinking sand, you know, the people who built their house on cards and they they filled it with bloodshed, they understand that if one little th piece of this pulls out, it's all coming crumbling down. And so instead they do what they turn is they attack the witnesses. They attack the victims. They attack the very people who are bringing the evidence out. And that's just the one play they got, you guys. Here's If you can endure that, which is what happened to me when I tried to come out against my family. At first they just turned against me and tried to devour me verbally and destroy me. They went after my friends, my family, my job, my employers, my churches. My dad was on a fanatical rampage trying to silence me and trying to destroy my reputation to the people around me. But what happens if you're willing to walk into this and understand that you're going to lose everything, that's okay. Because you know what? I have lost everything for the sake of the truth. And what I have instead now is a foundation of peace. My family is living on a house of joy and of life and not a house of bloodshed and of violence. I don't have children that are all fractured and running around and disorganized and they're filled with all kinds of sexual abuse scars that are on their body like are on mine instead they're set free to be able to walk in the home of hope 
by doing that, when you do that and you resist that onslaught, that's inevitable. That's going to happen when you come out and you try to speak your testimony. They're going to turn and try to devour you. It's like the, the child who comes forward and says, you know, Uncle Tommy's been raping me. And all the people are like, you know, she's kind of crazy. She doesn't always tell the truth, probably just part of her imagination, even though Uncle Tommy's been accused of it before in the past. And Uncle Tommy has this horrible other addiction that we don't ever talk about. Even though those things have been coming forward for a long time. Like I got an email from a gal who went to a, a, a Torah or a Christian fellowship. And her daughter, who was 12 years old, was being groomed by the pastor, the worship pastor of the fellowship. He was being grooming her and then began to seduce her until he was raping her when she was 13 years old and he was 21 years old. And you know what happened when that came forward, when she came forward and told her mom and her mom came forward and told those people and they sat down and they told her, you know what, your daughter probably just needs to marry him. If she just marries him, this will all get a lot better for her. That's the right thing to do. And her mother, the mother of the perpetrator said, they just keep getting younger every time. They just keep getting younger every time. This is because nobody was willing to stand up and put to death the doctrines of demons that have infected people to cover up crimes instead of reveal them. But as long as that happened, you know what happened when that guy finally got sentenced to prison and he had hundreds of people as character witnesses in the room and she had very, very few because they waged the campaign on her. They turned to devour her because that's the only tactic the adversary has is to lie and keep lying because eventually, as all of the propagandists know, if you keep telling a lie long enough and over and over enough, people will probably begin to believe it. So if they just say these people are liars and instead throw the, the whistleblowers in jail, instead throw the Hampstead mother her in jail, then it sets a theme. Then it sets a, th a, a an echo in the kingdom. I'd be like, you know what? It's not worth coming for. Just like what they did with, New with, with Boys Town, just like what they've done in all of these scandals that have broken out in the past, they turn and will devour the people that try to come against it. But you know what? When you put up a united front and you're willing to suffer that, and then people around you who are aware of that, this smells like bull honking, we're not going to have anything to do with it, that you surround and support survivors when you surround them and encourage them and strengthen them and equip them with what they need in in order to deal with the trauma, to get healing and restoration, they become one step free, some of the most powerful and effective people on the face of the earth, because that's why they were targeted. I was targeted at a young age because I had an inexplicable will to survive. I was not willing to die. I wanted to. When I was dealing with that, just like what those children are dealing with, when you're trying to find justice, you're trying to find a way out, and you're being forced over and over again to, to sink down in the mire, to sink down into the sins of sodomy, when you're stuck in that and trapped in that, you either give in you either give in or you give up and you know what for a season i had to give into it i had to become it i had to be a part of it and you know what but i waited and i hoped and i prayed because at a very young age i read that word i read the scriptures as soon as i could read i read it from beginning to end because i wanted to know how did people get out of slavery how did they get out of bondage and that's why these words are written on my wall it says i am yahuwah your elohim who brought you out of the land of mitzrayim the land of egypt out of the house of bondage you shall have no other Elohim and no other gods before my face. Front and center, first thing he ever said in his 10 words was, I'm the one who brought you out of the house of bondage, the house of slavery. The reason I'm out, Eric, is, or Sean, is because I clung to those words as if my life depended on it, because I knew that that was truth. And if everybody else had an ulterior motive, if everybody else had a different agenda, a secret agenda that they weren't willing to tell me up front, I knew somewhere truth abided and I found it in the living word of testimony and I found it in the stories of people that had been raised in horrible situations who got out like Rahab who is listed among the genealogy of our Messiah even though she was an outsider even though she was an abused woman even though she grew up in the in the very walls of Jericho that were filled with the bodies of the infants that have been sacrificed to charge it up to energize this geomantic great working to try to charge up that initial iniquity force, even though she was living in those walls as a prostitute, she heard, she heard these stories. She heard these testimonies because it said when the father judged, when Yahuwah judged the mighty ones of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, when he judged their gods, that's how the people got set free. And you know what? That's why if we will fall on our faces and ask him to judge these spirits Judge these mighty ones that are behind these agendas and stop looking at the agents of evil so much and start studying the mechanics of how to identify, how to identify our spiritual adversaries and start seeking the father's intercession on, the, on our behalf for justice, that he would contend with those who contend with us and our families and bring justice in Yeshua's name, that he would deliver us, forgive the sins that have empowered this kingdom of darkness, that he would forgive the sins that have empowered this occult working all the way down to their ancestors, that he would deliver these people. 
heal them and save their souls. And if they're not going to stop, that he would stop their hearts. Because you know what? We don't need another assassin's bullets fired in through their hearts. What we need is a supernatural work of Yah that happened when an Ananias and Sapphira came in before Peter and they lied out of their own lips and they testified falsehood. And you know what? They fell dead at his feet because you cannot lie and mock the Holy Spirit and get away with it. And you know what? People have made a mockery of him in these Christianized institutions, in these Catholic and Protestant institutions, because we got 40,000 denominations and all of them are systemically rotten with the daughter of the whore. We're supposed to break bread with one another in our houses to get to know each other. And we can actually read this word together from beginning to end and find out how do we fight back? How do we wage our war? How do we become sons and daughters of righteousness, of truth, of hope? How do we get our identities back that have been stolen from us, that have been raped from us? And because that fire was burning in me from the earliest days of my youth, I knew there was going to come a time where I could get out and I could make a choice and be free. And you know what? It came along when I met my wife and she showed me something different. She showed me love, like unadulterated, not perverted, Without another agenda, she showed me authenticity, and she showed me what normalcy could be. She showed me hope brought to fruition, and as I got to know her, I began to slowly allow little pieces of my past to leak out to see whether or not she'd be willing to still love me and embrace me and hold me as I began to bring out these horrible nightmares of what had happened to me, to reveal the darkness to a woman that was innocent to someone who had not known this or been affected by this. She was the bystander. And you know what? She got caught up in a family of familial incest and abuse and torture. And she, when I finally was able to tell her, when I finally overcame the shame and the guilt and the dread, I finally shared it with her and she covered me with peace. She covered me with love. And you know what? Even though it was hard for her to believe, even though it was hard for her to understand, she had seen the fruits of wickedness hanging on my family's tree. She had seen disturbing enough evidence for long enough that she understood this is wickedness and this is why my husband is the way he is. And she committed herself to me. She embraced the covenant that we had before him, which is why marriage is such a sanctified, set apart thing. And it's a covenant that's to be guarded fiercely. It's to be, it's to be an absolute commitment to the bitter end that no matter what, we stick together because two of us together can drive back the 10,000. The reason we're alive and even though they sent assassins after us, even though they've sent people to discredit us and destroy us and try to ruin our life and kill my family, she has been my early warning system. The father has sent her dreams and visions and revelation and those gut churning feelings that women have that, that something's off here, those spiritual vibes of funkiness going on in that person. She has saved our life because of that time and time again. And you know what? Because of that, because of listening to his voice, I have never ever had to turn to my carnal weapons of my past in order to defend myself. I have had to instead and learn to embrace this tiny little pocket sword, this sword that's living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing through to the soul and spirit, the bone and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the hearts of man. And when you study it, it gives you the ability to discern this. It gives you the ability to pierce through their chameleon stare, to pierce through the scales of the dragon that have been hiding over people's eyes, veiling them from it. Because the reason Rahab got out was because faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes from the word of Elohim. If we don't take this word and eat it and drink of it on a regular basis and share it out boldly, nobody has a chance. But if we instead take the truth and take this fire and instead seek to set the captives free, to raise the dead, to lay hands on the sick, to see healing and deliverance and restoration break forth again, it will indeed be a catalyst for true revival where men and women fall on their faces and ask for help. They ask for help and they petition him. It said the reason Yahuwah cried, the reason Yah answered them in Egypt, in the house of bondage, the same spirits that we live in under the influence of ISIS and Baal living in Nimrod's erection, sitting there as the capital of their Washington monument with the apotheosis of George Washington being enthroned on the throne of Zeus. This great wicked working that's happening from this district of Columbia, this district of demons, when we instead resist that, we fall on our faces and ask the Father to contend with that. Just like in those days, it said that his, their cries came up to heaven. The cries in Sodom and Gomorrah came up to heaven. And you know what? The people whose souls are vexed at this are going to be marked with peace and with protection. And those that are not are going to be marked for destruction. Man, the spirit of the, 
The Holy Spirit is definitely pouring through you, my friend, and uh, all praise to your wife and Yeshua. Amen. Um, God bless your wife. Uh, I, I want to ask you, boy, you got me spinning here. Let me just say this. I can feel the Holy Spirit working through you. You are definitely a tool to destroy this kingdom of darkness. And there's one thing I just want to say. I want to kind of rewind to the way I opened the show, guys. I've mentioned the Hampstead cover-up. Gabriel and Elisa, the abuse they suffered. Think of the kids of the Franklin cover-up, yeah. the victims of Sir Edward Heath and Jimmy Savile, the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and the Podesta brothers, in my view. I want you to remember how I opened the show talking about the bloodlines of the Illuminati, Fritz Springmeier's, Fritz Springmeier's important work in which I think at least some of the families mentioned were the Bushes, the Reynolds, the Rothschilds, Rockefellers, and DuPonts, these victims of sexual, these victims of satanic ritual abuse, victims like Nathan, they're made to do terrible things when they're little and they're impressionable and they're imprinted and they're destroyed and their souls are targeted for destruction as is their bodies. Are you guys ready for this? This is an article from Forbes, how a DuPont heir avoided jail time for his heinous crime. What did he do? He raped his three-year-old daughter and he raped his son. This man was six foot four. He weighed 300 pounds. And in front of the judge, he said, sorry, I feel bad. No excuse for what I've done. Guess what the judge did? She didn't sent sentence him. She didn't sentence him to prison because she said he wouldn't fare well in prison. Yeah. You know what they do to pedophiles in prison? Well, she got that right. So he was given probation and a $4,395 fine. A DuPont. A DuPont. Let that sink in. Nathan Reynolds, I'm so grateful you escaped with your soul intact because the Holy Spirit is definitely using you in powerful ways. I'm going to be super transparent with you. I am, my soul was not intact. My soul is still not intact. My, I'm still a, a broken man. Don't ever make me an idol for anybody because then you're going to fall prey to the very same poison that everybody does, which is looking for a man to be their savior. We're just people. And you know what? We're just people who are willing to lay down our lives and understand that we have to fight back against this, and we can never do it without him. He's the only reason I have any power, any life, any hope, any destiny, any, any aspect of deliverance within me has come from him. The reason I am here today is because one man laid down his life. Tom Dunn laid down his life next to me and preached to me and prayed for me and told me the words of my master, Yeshua, the same thing that he gave to others was forgiveness, was mercy, was, was joy, was life. He laid down his life as a ransom for many. And when Tom Dunn laid down next to me, it's a chapter called Deliverance in Dallas, chapter five of my book. I talk about this. When he laid down next to me there, I was, I'd fallen on my face. My wife was four months, five months pregnant with my daughter at the time. And I was facing this mountain of a decision that I knew if I opened this up, if I told her about this, everything would be different. I would, we would never have, I was waiting for that fortune. I had this promissory note hanging over me all my life that someday I would be given keys to this kingdom that I could, I could wage this war that I had been strategically planning since the day of my youth, the great revenge list, the list of every name of every individual who ever got off and ever got away, whoever went on and carried out their works of darkness publicly. I was going to wage that war perpetually against them. When I finally got the keys to the kingdom and the empire was entrusted to me, I wanted to go after every single one of those people and in bring about their absolute true justice. And instead, I had to choose whether I was willing to surrender that, that promissory note that came from liars and thieves, and I would have to give up compromise like that man did, where he was willing to sodomize and rape his three-year-old, his, his son and his daughter. That man was willing to engage in the most depraved act, and you know what he gets? The keys to the kingdom. That man passed the test in that world. That man gets promotions, and you know what? Any place that wants to promote that kind of ideology, that kind of behavior is so inutterably corrupted. That is Sodom and Gomorrah, y'all. This is the real deal, Sodom and Gomorrah. When you think this is bad, that that can be public information, wait until it's cannibalism and necrophilia and every kind of evil act that these people will herald 
They will lift up and exalt. And when you know that that evil is coming upon you, Yeshua said, it's not until the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the son of man, which means it is going to look like that where everybody is accepting of every form of evil continually. The reason they wrote that constitution that way was not to protect your freedom of speech, Sean. They didn't want to guard your freedom of religion. They wanted to guard the occult necromancers. They wanted to equip the secret societies with a refuge and a and a haven to dig in and to build an underground kingdom because they were going to rise from the ashes of this pyritic order, this phoenix rising from the ashes to create and resurrect their new Atlantis. They are going to unleash that system unless we are willing to eagerly contend against it, to lay down our lives for it, to seek his face, to seek his favor, and ask him to help us, to empower us, to equip us with what we need to set the captives free. And so that's what I've done. I have gone in my secret place, and I have prayed and petitioned to him, save me, empower me, help me. I surrender every other power that I ever had. I give it up. I give it up freely because you know what? A bloody kingdom, if I try to work and, and operate to bring justice when the dollars that I use to do it are dripping with the deception, are dripping with all of the blood of the innocents that were sacrificed in order for that to come to existence, then I am a sorcerer of that same kingdom. And if instead I go and trust him with everything I have, and I believe he is El Shaddai, who he revealed himself to Abraham, when he revealed himself to Abraham and he said, come and walk before me. I am El Shaddai. I am your father, your mother, your covering, your provider, your protector. I am the all-sufficient one. I am like the mother that gave you nurse and suck, gave you suckling breasts to feed on, to sustain you when you couldn't take care of yourself. I will be like that to you. I will be a father who is a shepherd over you, who guards you and provides for you and protects you. Those whom you bless, who bless you, they will be blessed. Those whom curse you, they shall be cursed. And you know what? I came to understand that's who I serve. And if I willingly submit and surrender my choices, my will, my actions to his desire, to his will, I could have him as my father, as a father that I never really knew, as a true father who gave up his most precious treasures so that his children could have life, life abundantly. He gave his son to us and we tore him to pieces. They literally screamed, let his blood be on us and our children forever. And you know what? We would have gone along with the crowd just as readily, just as easily. We would have been so beguiled by the propagandists, by the Pharisees, the brood of vipers, the serpent cults that permeated the, the cultures of society, those people that were going down and listening to the foretelling of Python, and those people that went and worshipped under the gods of the, the muses. There was a society that was practicing all the same abominations. They just did it openly back then. And you know what? Now is our time for us to instead to call upon him to set us free. And when Tom Dunn prayed for me, just like he would have prayed for anybody else, a man who was coming undone, the father answered that man's prayer. He answered my brokenness. He answered my desperation, and he sought me out for deliverance, and he lifted out of me. That is what is on the cover of this book. He lifted my tree, my family tree, out of the fires of this filthy, strange kingdom, and he gave me life from that dead twig. And as soon as he got his hands on me, life came from death. And he is the only one that can redeem all of this great evil. Because you know what? Even as Joseph was trafficked and sold to his brothers and abused and falsely accused, and people bore false witness against his character until he was thrown in prison, even after all of it was said and done, the father undid everything with one dream to the king. All it takes is one dream to trouble these people and take their sleep. And you know what? They will understand immediately that even if they call all their sorcerers, all their spiritual advisors, as they're called in our modern language, even if they called upon all of them to advise them on what to do, there would only be one man who had the true interpretation of that dream. And that man could set the nations free. Joseph saved the world and everything it says that they intended for evil, the father intended for good and the saving of many lives. That's why I'm here to remind you all, to stir to remembrance these words that have been written long ago. They're still true. They're still valid. And you can bet your life on them. I am a living witness of that. Naomi, Jubilee, Abraham, and Pearl are living stones. They're living witnesses because you know what? At the end of the day, we are made to be living stones, unhewn, not carved to be a brick in Babylon, but to instead be used by him to bear witness in the unique and perfect custom catered way that you were made to do to lift up your brothers and sisters, to lay down your life, to become servants of others. And by doing so, when you humble yourself, he can exalt you at the time and the hour of his choosing.
Do you guys realize that uh, people like Janet Yellen and Hillary Clinton get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to travel around and give speeches saying nothing to sycophants? In this man's struggles, this man walked away from hundreds of millions of dollars, I assume certainly a family fortune, and uh, he did it in order to save his soul. And so I want to pay it forward, guys. I have a very, so I want to pay it forward. Nathan, I have a very, very, very supportive audience. So here's your book on Amazon, but y'all, I don't recommend getting it there. Get it directly from the website snatched, snatchedfromtheflames.com. But in addition to that, the Linen Railroad, how can my listeners, look, those of us who go to church on Sundays don't get testimony like you just gave. We don't get preachers. We don't give, we don't get pastors that speak with the fire in their bellies like you just did. How do we support you and your family? By going and doing likewise. It could set so many more people free. If you just take the example of my life and try to live it out, there's so many people who are out there like this. This is not, this is not uncommon. If you're willing to look a little closer, it's the last chapter of my book. It's the last chapter of my book. This is what I say. Maybe instead of your next tithe check getting dropped into an offering plate or donation box, it needs to go to your neighbor, your coworker, or a family friend. It is time we looked closer instead of looking away. Maybe some of those preparations you've stockpiled for the end of the world could help a feed a, a family this week. Or perhaps the hours you spend watching Netflix could be spent talking to someone who needs your attention and time. Intentional ignorance will be accounted unto you in the days to come. Hunger is eating so many people alive. Some are starved for attention, never knowing the feel of lustless eyes upon their flesh. Some are hungry for friendship that is not tainted by manipulation and control. Others are drowning in debt because no one taught them how to manage money while they were making them work the trade instead. We need to be the answers, not the problems. We need to look closely enough to feel the breath of their sobs on your cheeks. We need to hold the hurting and tell them it's okay, you are safe now. We need to wrap our arms around the survivors and weep with those who weep. We need to linger and not run away from the horrible stories they need to tell. We need to build a hedge of protection around them as they leave their families, masters, pastors, and pimps. We need to be the empowering arms of grace, enfolding them in protection, provision, and love. That's how you can support my family. Support us by going and making a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple. Go and do likewise. Go and read these books as if they're alive and real, that this is true and trustworthy, that you should make the decision for your life and for how you spend your money instead of some 401k hedge manager, from some, from some illusory retirement plan that you hope to cash in on one day. There's no retirement from this kingdom, y'all. We fight this thing out until the death, and you should use every tool and resource and asset that you have in your hands and in any type of digital or closet or bank account. You should be the one controlling and managing that instead of giving your power away to other people to use it at their discretion. If you're still using those resources to support these corporate cowards, that's a shame on you. That's a guilt that's on you. The blood guilt is on you because they're using your money to build an empire of destruction to keep you in prison. And instead, you could use those very resources to completely transform this world, to be buying up apartment complexes and creating houses of refuge, to instead being purchasing people out of true slavery. Do you know how many people I know that wage this war relentlessly without any pay, without any recourse? course. Instead, they're doing this in their part time. They are so effective and so capable and they're working for 12, 15, $17 an hour. And instead we could be buying these people out of their Monday through Friday jobs, and we could be empowering them and their skills and their resources and their tenacity with everything they need in order to overcome this and to be effective warriors for the kingdom. I have a playlist called becoming a gibberim because this is the word you read about the special forces of all special forces, the ones who aren't filled with corruption and compromise. The word in Hebrew is called Gabor, mighty ones, mighty men of valor. When you read about David, the guy who killed tens of thousands of people, the guy who was a vigilant warrior, the one who stood up when everyone ran in fear and hid in their caves, when everyone else shoved their eyes in the sands of ignorance and said, I don't want to look at Goliath. I don't want to hear that mighty one. I don't want to hear what he has to say. When everyone saw the enemy, David saw the fool. He saw through their facade. He understood that anybody who mocks and makes 
brings vanity to the name of Yahuwah is already marked for destruction. And all that's necessary is for one man to walk up and set themselves apart and say, I will not move off of this. There's a reason you're given this armor. The reason you're given this armor is because you were made for war and it is a time for battle, son. So gear up, get after it and go and join forces with the people who are doing this. I don't need you to use me for that. Go and find people for yourself. And if you believe in what they're doing, equip them with you have. People got plans and plans on plans and they're ready to run. They're just waiting for resources to come their direction and they will wage a highly effective war that they've been building and strategizing for for a long time. It just requires somebody doing something to help. And that's why you're here because you may not be the person who was born to go on that front line, but you know what? We need people who are willing to support on the outside and be able to encourage and provide comfort. People literally fed my family. They sheltered us. They gave us places to park. We lived in an RV for four and a half years, traveling around this country, and we parked in people's driveways. I literally had to be sheltered like a spy in the land because people would come after us to kill us in Asheville, North Carolina. People came after my wife and I to murder us and my children. And you know what? We saw the hand of the father deliver us from their, their technology tracking us. We prayed that the father made us invisible to their eyes. And you know what? This drugged out demonized man who was carrying this big Bowie knife came walking into this goodwill with a tracker of my phone on his phone. And he, I prayed, father, make us invisible to him. And he looked right at me and could not see me. He looked right at my wife and he could not see her. The father has a power to protect you. That is so much greater than anything you could possibly comprehend. But unless you're in that battle, you're never going to know it. Unless you're actually carrying out the commission, the great commission, which is to go, therefore, into all the nations, all the cosmos, and preach this good news of deliverance, of hope, of freedom to every creature. That's your mission. That's what your commander has issued forth from his lips. And if you go, he's got your back. But if instead you go back into the closets of cowardice, you are absolutely 100% committed to the kingdom of darkness. And many of you, he's going to look at it and say, get away from me. I never knew you. The most terrifying words that ever could be spoken. So I pray instead that you would diligently guard the words that he's entrusted to you because the dragon goes to make war with those who guard the commandments of Yahuwah and keep the testimonies of Yeshua. So I want to be found right there. If that's where he says he's going to fight, then I want to be standing there among those brothers and sisters, shields of faith burning, knowing that the shields of the earth belong to Yahuwah. And if they take our lives, you know what? Praise be to Yah, because freedom is my long-awaited promise that there's going to come a day where I will lay down and sleep in peace, and I will have the freedom I've been waiting for my whole life. All my life, I've been waiting for that sweet slumber. And you know what? As much as I want it, I'm not going to go idly until I'm done here. I'm going to run this race till it's absolute finish. And that's what you're here to do. Fight with everything you have. Cleanse yourself. Take care of the temple that you've been entrusted with your body. Detoxify yourself from the poisons they've been pummeling you with. And you will get set free to wage this war effectively. Man. Well, you know what Yeshua is going to say to you when you meet him? Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what he's going to say to you, Nathan. And uh, I tell you what, well, I think I've said enough because I think I got it right at the beginning. I got it right at the beginning of the conversation. This is one of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. And it's not because I'm good at interviewing people. It's because you're amazing. All right. He gave us the keys too, guys. How do we fix this whole thing? By raising up a generation who is not like them. Not like the evil ones that control this world, not like the Illuminati, the New World Order, those that engage in satanic ritual abuse and child sacrifice. They are demon spawn. I say it time and time again because it's true. And Nathan walked away from the same infrastructure, the same deep state, the same hellish hellishness on this planet that profits people like Janet Yellen and Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and the Gates family, and people like the Bushes, the Bush family, they all profit from this system that Nathan Reynolds walked away from. We respect you very much, Nathan. Thank you very, very much. One more time here, I want to show your website because I know my supportive audience is going to snap up your book. I hope you have a lot of signed copies on hand. Signed or not, signed or not, people will be buying your book. Here's the website, guys, snatchedfromtheflames.com. Audiobook is now available too. And here's some teasers. If this isn't the entire book, maybe it, it is, is the entire oh book. You goodness. can listen to the entire book for free on there. And the entire You're, is you're a very generous book. man. It's, Go I don't ahead. Need, what? I don't want to monetize men. I don't want to merchandise men. That's why the only time Yeshua ever made a weapon on this earth was to drive out the people that were merchandising his people. So I don't ever want to fall prey to that that system. 
Well, I can't thank you enough for your time today, your testimony, your intellect. <laughs> You're one of the smartest people I've ever spoken with. Uh, and by the way, I did have Richard Grove on my show at huh. least once. I also think I had the guys on, what was it, Through the Dark or Through the Black? Through the Black. Tom I Dunn swear and Jerry I had them on. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I had those guys on at one point. Never had Russ. I never had Russ Dizdar on. Uh, but you've mentioned some really important books. So before we say goodbye, let's just recap some of those books, one of which was The Black Awakening by Russ Dizdar. You also mentioned a book in your interview with uh, in your interview with FM8. Uh, and that book was The Discovery and Conquest of Mexico. Yes. And another book that you really recommended was In Plain Sight by Gloria. Was it Farthy? Is that right? Can you show us those books? Because I have a knowledgeable audience that just hungers for this. This is an absolutely well worth your time as well. Any of you that are trying to actually understand and identify some of the mechanics of this intercontinental system that we live in here in America. It was not discovered, by the way, by good old Columbus. You know what I'm saying? This woman was an uh, uh, archaeologist who went about revealing all kinds of the uh, in interconnected travelers going back and forth in this country. And here you can see how these same gods of antiquity that we read about in the scriptures have been here. And people have been doing the same cultic practices that we read about in the scriptures. And those same mighty ones had their occupied territory here, just like over there. So this is a valuable tool as well. Um, one other book that's written by the wife of Dr. Michael Lake and Mary Lou. This is incredibly critical, which is called What Witches Don't Want Christians to Know. Absolutely credible, written by Mary Lou Lake, and one of the best reads for those of you who are trying to understand some of what I was talking about, as well as written from a female perspective of someone who went through this, and then how the occult and how everybody went after them and tried to shut them up and silence them. But there's another living stone that they just can't seem to kill because, you know, you can't kill people that says you're immortal until Yahuwah says otherwise. Don't you ever let anybody convince you of anything other than that. Well, Nathan, I got to tell you, I don't even know how to end this interview. I don't even want to say goodbye. I mean, we keep going another 20 minutes and we're two hours deep, but uh, maybe, we, maybe we can do this again sometime. Absolutely. Anytime you reach out to me. All right. I appreciate you very much. Nathan Reynolds has been our guest. The website, guys, snatchedfromtheflames.com. Nathan, until next time, God bless you, sir, and your family, your beautiful family. Likewise.